Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. People have been yelling at me for years that I've not covered more technical aspects of the web's history, especially things like Java, specifically Java. Um, The reason for that is because I'm not a web developer myself, but I do know that the truth is the argument can be made that Java helped the web evolve into what it's become. So that's why I was thrilled to sit down with Todd Sunstead, who is a developer who has been working with Java for more than 20 years. Todd walks us through the history of Java and why it's so important to the web's general evolution. Please enjoy. Todd Sunstead, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Yep, not a problem. Great to be here. Um, I feel like I've, I've... been doing a bunch of episodes in a row with people that stumbled into tech, but you went to school for EE, right? Yep. Um, so uh, were you a stereotypical computer nerd growing up, or how did you uh, find your calling, as it were? Yeah, so it might be the case, actually. I had uh, two uncles who were in electrical engineering, uh, and uh, so there was uh, an established pattern already for getting into that. Um, in uh, high school, I stumbled into uh, computers, and so I had... Uh, some early involvement with like a TRS-80 and then mm-hmm. uh, later on a Sinclair ZX-81. So early, mid-80s we're talking yeah. here, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and so you graduate uh, late 80s? Uh, I graduated high school in 84 and college in 89. And did you know that you were, you were gonna be a programmer? Is that the, the jobs you were going for in say mm-hmm. 89 or 90? So actually not, so I really, really wanted to do electronics. Mm. Uh, and so I had, uh, made a decision to uh, to work in electronics and even did that for a year uh, when I got out but uh, I had taken a lot of programming classes I had done a lot of hacking in that area to begin with uh, and so for me it was uh, something that I was comfortable with uh, and and I kinda did just for relaxation so what happened in my particular case is I worked uh, for about a year uh, doing mostly embedded stuff mm-hmm. and then uh, I went to graduate school and then I wound up in a lab where I was the one guy who could program mm-hmm. and so I ended up doing all the code. Um, is, uh, do you remember, uh, you probably used the internet uh, in school maybe. Usenet. Usenet. Well, that, that counts. That was, that was my entree as well. We had like a, I think a UUCP node when I was yeah. an undergrad. Uh, and got net news that way. And then uh, when I went to uh, graduate school, they actually had an internet uh, connection at that point. Mm-hmm. Did you, do you remember uh, first encountering uh, the web or using a browser or something like that? I do, in fact, uh, we had, I had been using Gopher, for, uh, which is probably the story, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, for, uh, a n- for a while anyway, I don't remember how long it was. Uh, I remember when uh, CERN announced uh, their browser, and you had to tell that in to a port to actually use it at that point. Uh, and it was interesting. I mean, I think uh, Mosaic was really the reason that it caught on, right? The ability to put graphics in there, I think, was the, that image tag was really the, the killer killer feature, I think, that made it take off. Sexing up the web, as uh, Andreessen said. Yes, <laughs> um, yep. So uh, let's talk about um, your um, getting involved in Java, and then we'll come back to the Java story. Yep. So um, is that something that you get involved in early on when, when Java starts to surface? or? Yeah, so the trajectory, I actually had to think through this a little bit uh, this weekend uh, to remember how it worked out. So when I went to graduate school, I was lucky enough to wind up in a lab that was actually using uh, Sun OS and then Solaris. Uh, so it was a lab that was doing uh, computational neuroscience, and so they were building models. and. Uh, using simulation software that uh, you know basically only ran in, in Solaris or some kind of unix platform. So I started, uh, and I had learned C prior to that at, at some point in college or maybe uh, in high school I had started using C. Uh, 
but uh, you know the the language was of course you know across the range. There was some stuff in Lisp. Uh, there were some things in C. Uh, basically toolkits. And so whenever we needed to hack on them, I would be the one who was doing the hacking, mm -hmm. right? Trying to, to extend them so people could run uh, experiments or run simulations. Uh, while I was in graduate school, I was taking I just took some computer science classes. Uh, and in particular, uh, I wound up taking classes with a bunch of guys who were working for uh, a, s a department called Energy Management System Services, uh, which was a department, engineering department inside a southern company, which is a power utility. Uh, and they were using uh, Unix and Solaris as well, right? Uh, plus, uh, I guess in addition, I had, uh, you know, kind of the C programming skills and whatever. So at some point, I, I was you know, at the point where your classes are kind of done and you're starting to work on your dissertation. And so I got sidetracked into uh, going to, uh, I got sidetracked into taking a job with them. So I wound up in a department that was also using Solaris. So they had, they were, I mean, I had the pizza box uh, spark on my desk, mm -hmm. right? So when the alpha ver version of, of Java came out, you know, I was downloading things and building things and, you know, doing my work work, but obviously looking around at different tools and whatever. And so it was the obvious thing to do, download this technology and play with it. Uh, so sometime early in 95 is probably when I downloaded alongside, you know, the first couple hundred people outside of Sun that did the same thing. I have a memory, it might have, it might have been 96 or early 97, because I in college I, I wasn't a CS major, but I knew a lot of them. And suddenly everyone I knew was carrying around these thick learning Java, JavaScript books. <laughs> it, was, it just like took over everyone. Okay, so um, let's, let's try to uh, tell a little bit of the story of Java. So it, it, it's a project inside Sun, but um, am I right? It's like it gets started like as early as 91 or something yeah. like this. So pre-web, this is a project at, at Sun. Yep, yep. And they were looking at, uh, um, I guess I don't know really the original thing that they were working on, but very early on they started focusing on the opportunity building toward kind of smart devices for television or interactive television, the set top box thing. Uh, and they had built a language, I think, uh, you know, somewhat general purpose, meant to be a simpler C. So at the time, um, and, and it's interesting too, looking back, right, the number of things that exist now that didn't exist then, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were looking at building software in mid 95, 94, 93, you know, 91 in that time frame, uh, you really didn't have nearly the options you had now. Something like Pascal was probably a valid option at that point, which, you know, no one would probably consider a, a, an alternative today. Um, you may have had Perl, a version of that. You probably had an early version of Tickle. Um, you had an early, early version of C++. You had Smalltalk. So it was a fairly small world of tooling. Uh, Sun had developed a language called Self, which was object-oriented in a different flavor. Uh, so you kind of had a, a very small environment to pick from. So uh, C plus object-oriented programming was a big thing at that point. You know, big companies hired object mentors to help them come in and retool their thought process around object orientation. Uh, and so you know, small talk and C++ were the, were the were progressive languages at the time, but C++ in particular, C, small talk was very unfamiliar uh, to most developers, many developers, and, and C++ was just hard. I mean, it was, I remember thinking it was a hard language, and I remember going back to it after doing a few years of Java, and it felt like, you know, pulling barbed wire out of your throat to try to remember how to do <laughs> mm -hmm. just the simplest things. So it was a hard language. Even though, even though because Java's based off of C syntax, so it's, yeah. yeah. It's inspired by right, okay. uh, by the syntax. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, so what they were looking for was a language that was object-oriented. I think they got that, right? This is important. Uh, and they wanted, but they wanted a language that wasn't as hard. Like, it, it, you know, C++ was just tough. Uh, and so they tried to pick, you know, kind of the best parts of C++, leave off the more complicated pieces, leave off multiple inheritance, for instance, and, and areas, and, and then kind of, Take over memory management. That was a trick uh, that I think uh, you know, Smalltalk and some other languages had grabbed. Lisp, obviously, you don't think about that to try to make a simpler little language uh, to build systems in. So I think it originally kind of started broadly as a tool for building systems. They identified the set-top box thing then as a potential market for that. You know, the, you know that's so funny because when you think of I've talked about it a lot on the show the the inter information superhighway. 
that everyone was promising. Like Jim Clark, before Andreessen convinced him to do Navigator, um, they were going to do a set-top box or something with Nintendo or whatever. So I'm, I'm just thinking at the time, like, okay, what is the use cases for th that we want to develop this thing for? And that's seemingly the thing that everyone's trying to chase at that point. Yeah, because well, because right now, if you go to my apartment in the city, right, I've got a PlayStation, I've got an Xbox, every member of the family's got an iPhone. Uh, we've got a bunch of laptops sitting around, and I think in a box, I'm sure uh, I've probably got a PC uh, that uh, I'm not even using for anything. And heck, I think my television's probably technically a computer at this point, right? right? So, you know, the, 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 and I got an Alexa, which is this little thing connected to a computer, right? So, so computing is, is absolutely ubiquitous for, for at least a solid chunk of the population of the planet. Obviously, there are tremendous you know, inequalities if you get outside of the United States or even get into different uh, groups. But in general, computing is very ubiquitous, and that just wasn't the case then. So people looking for an interesting gadget to hook people on, mm -hmm. you know, what's the thing people do? They watch a lot of TV. Gee, if we can make that interactive. I mean, people sat and tried to make interactive television. Well, and, and digital television since. was new also. Yeah. Like, that was a growth market yeah. because they were just digitizing and having these hundreds of channels at the time. Um, so is, it's also, I, I'm going to take a stab in the dark here, but it's also they're thinking of these different platforms and we want it to be able to run universally, right? Yep. That's a big thing that they're, yep. the because problem the they're trying to solve. consumer angle on the thing. We'll talk a little bit about that. As a developer at that time, you know, we're expecting that you, you, you write an app now and you can run it on 90% of the devices with not too much trouble, but at, in the early 90s, if you have an app, what do you have to do to get it on the universe of devices? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I would say that, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking uh, nearly insurmountable. If you really think about the gamut of what was available, and actually, let me zoom forward just a little bit, yeah, too. Yeah. So around maybe 99 or 2000 in that time frame, Sun came out with like, Java ME and you know for the micro things and this embedded super slim Java for rings that you would wear and, and whatever right so they built a whole bunch of versions of Java a bunch of across a bunch of profiles uh, which I think is interesting now let me zoom back mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. away from that uh, earlier for a moment if you look at the gamut of things that that at ran some kind of software uh, you know you were talking about Motorola devices you were talking about uh, a bunch of different CPUs, maybe RISC CPUs that ran different versions of Unix. You had the Intel platform, uh, and those were just for kind of servers and desktops. Then you had uh, smaller versions, the, uh, 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 I can't even think of what they were, the smaller 80 something, 80, 85, 80, 80 ones. I can't even remember that you would run if you were building a keyboard or some kind of embedded mm -hmm. device. Uh, if you were going to use something that was programmable at all. So there weren't nearly the, the kind of, uh, uh, rain, the, the, there were a lot more options out there, uh, almost in any different flavor. Uh, if you were dealing with, so if you weren't on building for Windows, for instance, and you were trying to build system software that ran on Unix, the porting problem was huge. Uh, when I had left uh, school and gone to work, the first, and this was pre-doing anything with Java, uh, it was, you know, my first job was actually porting this large system from AIX to Solaris, and it took weeks, I mean, probably months of effort on my part just to deal with the differences, even for a common language like C on different platforms. So the amount, the, the, the level of heterogeneity out there was just, was crazy. And then you start talking about different uh, companies putting out a consumer device that you may want to build your system for, and it starts to make sense to think about, okay, we need some kind of common framework to build that on. I mean, I don't think run one, right once run anywhere was in exactly in their mind at that mm. point, but I think they understood that to build a consumer device or a device that's potentially uh, going to be relatively easy to retarget to different systems, you probably want some kind of common layer there, right? You don't want to have to write the whole compiler again. You want something, well, like a bytecode. Mm -hmm. uh, Pascal had like P code for that reason, right? It was this this intermediate layer that you could target to so you build a small VM or a kernel that runs on a different hardware platform uh, but then the rest of your system software and application software sits and ultimately compiles down to that P code and that's what bytecode really is. Do we have a sense, uh, was it a major Sun initiative or was this like a Skunkworks project that people were working on in the background or uh, 
we'll get to when the web comes and all of a sudden, oh my God, we've been delivered this yeah. great opportunity. But um, what is your the historical sense of what it was? Was it a major initiative or not? I mean, Sun was a hardware company, yeah. so they were building. Uh, I mean, they were pushing certainly every time that I can think of dealing with. I was dealing with uh, sitting in on calls with salespeople trying to sell us hardware. Like they weren't selling us software mm -hmm. at all, right? The software was something that maybe they built. They had like OpenView, I think, was their toolkit and uh, some applications that ran inside of that, and they were pushing that, you know, maybe as part of getting you to the, interested in the, the desktop thing you were going to run or the big giant server you were going to stick in a back room. But they were very definitely a hardware company at that mm -hmm. point. Uh, I think that even when they were looking at building uh, Java, they weren't looking at building Java, they were looking at building another hardware platform mm -hmm. and Java was just a necessary step to get them to that point of being able to do it. So um, as we say, the web shows up and I don't know, Gosling, one of them, somebody says, realizes, wow, this is perfect for this platform. Uh, why, explain why. Uh, uh, the early versions of the web mm -hmm. aren't very interactive. <laughs> no, or no. or sexy, as we said. Yeah, and I don't think he even said, "Wow, this is perfect for the web." Mm. In fact, from what I understand it, uh, he was hauled along on a on a demo at some point. Uh, someone had one of the the folks at Sun had grabbed uh, his software and a couple systems from his office, had loaded them in a car, and was going to go down to. Oh, maybe Los Angeles, or maybe it was just San Jose. I can't remember, but was going to actually were, they were going to do a demo uh, and just kind of show this thing off. And he heard about it, or maybe was helping lug the equipment. And he's like, you know, where are you going? Okay, I better go because it was very new at the time, right? And he had um, no idea if Hot Java, which was their browser, was even going to run or Web Runner. Uh, so he went along on that, and I think maybe that had opened his eyes because at some point. Uh, I think they were demoing various pieces and people in the audience were kind of like, whatever, because, you know, Netscape was a thing and, um, you know, I don't know, until you see it, you just don't think about it, right? So at some point there was a little demo I think people have seen uh, of an atom scrolling around. So you have this static web page, there's a picture of an atom and then you wiggle the mouse and that thing spins in, in a very nearly real time for simple models. And I'm sure that that absolutely caught people's attention at that point because you know, the web really was static. I mean, dynamic on the web at that point wasn't DHTML right. or, or Ajax or whatever you right, know, we right, call right. it nowadays. Like, dynamic that, in those days, was you had a CGI script on the right. back end and you knew how to stick some data into the cookies so yeah. that maybe that page, when you refreshed, it changed in some intelligence yeah, just way. Just when forums came out, like the ability to get yeah. back information from yeah. users, yeah. Um, so, uh, well, we'll come, we'll come back to the idea of like Netscape and the browsers adopting it. Um, is it adopted, this is where you have more expertise than I am, is it adopted by developers because it, it's relatively easy to, to pick up compared to other things? Uh, I mean, at the time, I think it definitely was. Okay. Going back to the landscape again, you had a handful of scripting languages, uh, Tickle or Perl, there were probably some other ones out there that I'm, you know, Scheme, obviously, uh, or some version of Lisp. Lisp. So you had these, you know, a handful of kind of dynamically typed uh, scripting languages that were often fairly easy to use but but very slow I mean to be generous uh, and then you had a handful of more systems oriented languages uh, that were designed for bigger systems obviously some people probably put common Lisp in there but I'm thinking more like C and C++ mm -hmm. probably being the two big ones uh, but there there wasn't nearly the the surface that you've got now with Rust and, and Clojure and Scala and Java and Ruby and Python, like just you go on and on and there's people coming up with things on a regular basis. So, so the, if you really wanted to get things done, you probably were going to look at C++ or maybe C, uh, which had some issues, right? Uh, memory management being a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, so just abstracting away the notion of memory management was actually a big deal. They made a big point about saying, look, you know, you have a reference to an object. When you're done, you're done. The system will clean up after, after you. And if you sp had spent any time at all in your career, you know, banging your head literally against your desk trying to find some leak or some memory corruption issue that you'd introduced, it was immediately obvious. And I talked earlier about feeling like I was yanking, you know, barbed wire out of my throat. It was like just trying to remember when do I allocate, when do I have to free, how do I keep track of this stuff <laughs> yeah. again? Like you forget this whole, like as you're trying to solve this business problem, you've got this whole layer of system stuff you've got to keep in your head just to make sure that damn thing runs when you're done. 
Java removed that big chunk of that context you had to hold and it made it easier to think about the business logic you had to write. And, and honestly, I think that's why it started to appeal to folks on the enterprise side too, which is all about business logic. Like there's not a lot of creativity there. It's like we've got this business problem we want to specify and, and implement and you want something that requires as less little overhead as possible so you can just get that thing done. Well, does it, is it also unusually flexible? I, what I'm trying to get at is, is Java so important in the history because it was just the first to show up at the right time when people needed it? Or <clears throat> was it an unusually adaptable, forward-thinking language, you know? No, and I would say exactly the opposite. Okay. In fact, I think it, it struck a chord because of the stuff they didn't, they took out of the language. Mm. So if you took a look and started with C++, which I think, you know, you know, people probably would have thought was really the forward-looking, progressive, systems-level development language at the time. Uh, you know, not to, not to once again cut off Smalltalk or some other tools that mm -hmm. people were building, but I think a lot of people were certainly behind C++. Uh, what was, they, they really started from that and then started removing pieces, and I honestly think it was the removal of those pieces that got the, the, got the footprint down to a point that said, and then in addition, you know, adding in the management, the, the the virtual machine and the memory management, whatever it was, it was kind of adding a few things and removing a whole bunch of things that got it to the point. It's actually less expressive than a lot of languages. If you look at pure, you know, what could an expert developer do hmm. with it, right? I mean, they already had templates in C++, so people could do some level of metaprogramming, which wasn't available whatsoever uh, in Java. Haskell and some of the early ML languages were already available roughly at that same time as well. Uh, didn't have any of the functional composition and some of the things that people really forward thinking were thinking about. Uh, it wasn't dynamic and this, you know, it was statically typed, but it didn't have a really strong uh, type resolver. So you know, you know, it was a lot harder to use at that level than a pure scripting language. Uh, it, it, you know, so it, it it didn't have a lot of things, but I think the things that they got rid of were less important, and the things that they kept like I said, made it really easy to just adapt and go with. And, the, and they included a, good, a threading library. It wasn't an incredible threading library. It wasn't even much of a library. It was just the ability to create threads. But you started off with multi-threading right out of the gate. Uh, they were smart enough to put a network library inside of there, so you started off with networking out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been working with Scheme at that point in time, uh, and you know, or, or some other little languages like that, and like networking was not immediately the first thing you thought of you needed because you know the internet wasn't quite there yet. So having that available was great. Uh, having some small collection libraries that you know were easy to use, you know, kind of like had all the right little pieces, uh, but then got rid of a lot of the clutter that you had to deal with. Does uh, that make sense? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, but also, there's the political context. Um, we mentioned, you know, write once, have, be anywhere, run anywhere. Um, how much of it was everyone's afraid of Microsoft in 94, 95, and suddenly here's this, this area that they can't touch? Yep. They, tell, me, tell me about that. No, I think, so I think that is probably one of the more interesting parts about it, yeah. too, because I do believe that a big chunk of the push was in uh, response or, or kind of in reaction to Microsoft's increasing footprint. I mean, goes back before 95, but for sure from 95 to 99, 2000, I mean, you know, Google was founded in 98. Apple was making colored little computers in, in that time frame, right? That, like, Apple was nothing like it was today. Google didn't exist. Amazon barely existed. Uh, Microsoft was the frickin' company. I mean, IBM before it, but Microsoft had really kind of even pushed them out of the picture. And there were big enterprise companies like, uh, uh, you know, making databases and whatever, like Oracle. But, you know, the company that everyone thought of was Microsoft. That thing, they ruled the world. Uh, and they had a particular point of view about mm -hmm. how things should go. They had uh, their own point of view about, you know, kind of the, the notion of a web-like environment that wasn't on top of HTML. Um, yeah, the Blackbird, was Blackbird was, I think, right. was yeah, the yeah, thing yeah, that they were yeah. pushing or wanted to push. Uh, and they were well known for their kind of embrace and extend or whatever mm -hmm. your little phrase was. So, you know, they scared a lot of people. I can remember people literally saying, you know, don't bother starting a company now, right? It's like if it's any good, Microsoft's just going to, you know, grab what you're doing and run you out of business, right? Like that was like how people thought. So something that popped up 
you know, some other champion to get behind, I think was attractive. And, and it was a tool that ran on Unix, and there were a lot of Unix-like environments at that time. Uh, and so a tool that unified that and could potentially run across all of those was a very attractive proposition. <coughs> and one of the reasons why I think it's Netscape that first um, uh, uh, supports Java in their browsers. And so it is very much at the right moment in time this is an opportunity to go in the other direction and have Microsoft chase what we're going to do. Um, so Sun also open sources it right away, right? No, not right away. They okay. went a good long time, actually, before okay. they really open sourced it. But they wanted everyone to play. So I actually don't think their original plan was to open source it at all. Mm. I, I, I don't necessarily think that they were inherently antagonistic to the concept. Uh, certainly a lot of uh, free software ran on Solaris, for instance, uh, and so I'm sure they understood the benefit of that. I don't, so I don't necessarily think they were absolutely antagonistic to it, uh, but I don't think they were particularly interested in trying to do it. It seemed like it took a lot of effort to get it uh, available, and then when they finally made it available, even the licenses that it came out under were, you know, tricky. For instance, the 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 test suite that they released wasn't available on a license that was that a, a lot of folks thought was work, was compatible. Uh, leading, uh, I think, uh, oh, the Apache Foundation, I think, led the effort to try to get that you know released under like an Apache license so that people could actually gear, figure out whether their implementations were actually compatible. But so I think was, it took a long time to get to that. Point. But early on, there was like that alliance or something that they formed to like. I mean, the, are you talking about like the Java community process? Yeah, or, or something where, I, and maybe I'm misremembering this, where <clears throat> they're like teaming up with like the Netscapes of the world and even like the AOLs of the world or whatever, and like we're all on this Java Sun team. Yeah. And it, the implicit, if not explicit, thing is we're not on the Bill Gates team. Yeah, yeah. Well, they very definitely created a community kind of. Uh, community involved, maybe community-led mm. pro process called the Java Community Process fairly early on, uh, which was meant to help them define, you know, new features and extensions, kind of the evolution of the product going forward, and that went for quite a long time, uh, and uh, and I think you know helped basically create a uh, collection of companies that supported it, mm -hmm. uh, while also giving you know companies some say into how it actually evolved. Uh, they also uh, released it as a standard at some point as well, but they uh, uh, they released it as an uh, ECMA standard, I believe, uh, which gave them a lot of control over it as well. So it was technically a standard, but you know maybe not as open as some other kinds of standards were. Um, so speaking of evolution, how does it evolve, at least let's say, you know, through the 90s into the 2000s? Um, does it, is it a useful evolution? Does it start to stumble at some point? Like what is, what is the legacy of, say, you know, the first decade of, of Java? So I guess the interesting things that struck me as I was looking back at this were the pace that it actually moved at. Mm. So the Alpha came out in early '95, and they released one or one, one you know, Java one or you know, version 1.02, basically in January the year after that, and then I think Java one one came out a year after that, like February the next year, uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, 1.2 came out. So there was a fairly rapid evolution in terms of the, the release of it, uh, and it and it went and was adopted almost ridiculously quick in retrospect. Uh, and I think it actually managed to hit a bunch of high points just at the right time. So like a lot of things do, like timing really ends up being a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out and offered the promise of interactivity in the browser at just the right time. Uh, had it been a little bit later, maybe you know, JavaScript or LiveScript at the, you know, whatever it was called at the time would have been the thing that, you know, was actually allowing this interactivity or something Microsoft had developed might have been the plugin that did it or, or some early version of Flash or whatever. Uh, so they hit that. Uh, and then I think they uh, hit, uh, I think, the kind of the wave of we would like a simpler tool to build on, right? So applets really never became a big, big deal, I right. think. Uh, but the the notion of being able to build interesting application software in a simpler language hit. Just let's just hit on that for a second because early on people again this is in relation to Microsoft with applets and things like that people are like oh you're going to have the de your desktop will be on the web right like and so there's this period of time where people think that that's the future and that's what's going to kill Microsoft's domination and things yeah. like that, which ironically is almost the case now right? right? I mean I sit inside of my browser constantly and. 
actually, I don't even know what my desktop looks like, to be quite honest <laughs> right, with right, you. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, what was the question again? Was um, no, I was just going to hit on that for the, for the historical context that... <clears throat> Again, this is a time period when people are looking to blow up the desktop to get away oh, from, yes. from Microsoft. And so that's also one of the early promises of Java and using yep. applets and things like that. That's what they think is going to happen. Yeah, in fact, there was a thing called the Java Business Expo in 98 uh, over at the Java Center that mm -hmm. Sun put on. So Sun was the, the main vendor that kind of roped that whole thing together. And it was literally around the concept that everything's in the cloud. Remember, mm -hmm. Sun had that whole push around you know, the, the, it's kind of this, this notion that the cloud is where you want your computation mm -hmm. to be and um, you want your apps and everything. So in, in very prescient in many, many funny sorts of ways, but absolutely in reaction once again to the desktop. And absolutely an issue of timing because yeah. the right idea, but just it wasn't the yeah. infrastructure and things weren't there yet. Yeah, no, and it, it's actually funny, you know, they, they absolutely got clobbered in the dot-com crash mm -hmm. and, and I think really struggled and never really ever came around after that. Because uh, Linux, unfortunately, I think, kind of ended up eating their lunch on the server side, and they never really made any money off Java, uh, which is really too bad. But yeah, that message, oddly enough, was spot on. And I think if you just look at Sun's gyrations in general, right, they picked up the German company Stardesk or whatever it was called for their kind of office suite so that they could put something together, which now, I guess, lives on in the form of LibreOffice and mm -hmm. whatever in, in, in you know current form today. Uh, but that, you know, as, a, as you know, it was all about, and of course, Scott McNeely was notorious for you know barbs against Microsoft. I think the common complaint often was that he spent so much time worrying about Microsoft, maybe he didn't worry enough about his own business. But yeah. so, is that the thing? <clears throat> as as the millennium ends, at the turn of the century, um, things like Linux coming around and starting to supplant, and just the newer generations of languages coming around and. and doing what Java was doing, but better in the next generation. Yeah, I mean, I think Java, I mean, I used Java solidly for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So from the time I started using it, uh, I probably used it to the exclusion of almost any mm -hmm. other language until 2006. And what you, would you replace it with? Ruby. Okay, yeah. There you so, go. which was another inflection in my opinion. Uh, not so much about the technical merits of Ruby or Rails. Ruby as a language or Rails as a platform. Uh, but the, the business merits of that combination of rapid development, if you're trying to figure out how to test out a business theory, right, that was, a, that was the real innovation they brought. But yeah, I used it literally all the way up until that. Uh, and then I found myself, uh, I'd left the company I was with at the time, which was you know, using Java for its technology, uh, looking at doing a startup of my own, fighting through trying to get Hibernate to work with the database that I wanted and you know someone literally going you know there's this little language out there that that people talk about that's supposed to make this all really easy called Ruby on Rails you should mm -hmm. give it a try and I mean it was yeah, okay this is really good and, and I ended up spending a lot of time working with that uh, so but but I think that uh, in many ways it's it actually achieved its vision in a funny sort of way uh, you know people complained all the way along about things that it couldn't do that they wished it could do or uh, whatever, but the practical side of the matter is you've got a huge embedded footprint in Java right now uh, due in large part to the fact that I think it was not bleeding, bleeding edge constantly, which meant it was easy to adopt and you could trust it to be there. You could trust that the skills that you develop would be relevant. Uh, and so actually I think in some ways that, that pace that they charted, even though you know, Java as a language, you know, maybe got downplayed a little bit when they started supporting other things on the JVM. The, the practical side is that ecosystem, you know, there are a lot of libraries, there's a lot of tooling, there's a lot of expertise, there's a lot of embedded code, like it actually achieved its vision. You know, it's, it's uh, not the only thing on the block anymore and there are problems that it's probably not ideal for anymore, but I think it very definitely, like, I think if anyone in 95 or 96 had said this is someone said this is where it's going to be in you know 20 years they'd have been like okay that's great <laughs> you know yeah so what is like what is in the ecosystem what is the current state of java is it um still there but not as vibrant that not as necessary i mean it's so there's no doubt about it in popularity it's definitely declining i, I think i have yet to see anything that that convinces me that that trend isn't happening. And I see a lot of evidence, you know, in these kind of informal language uh, kind of surveys based on GitHub commits and, and other 
things like that, that Java in general is losing ground, at least relative to other technologies for sure. Uh, ironically, to uh, losing ground to JavaScript, mm -hmm. which was, you know, of course, named after Java, even mm -hmm. though it has absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, so I, you know, that that part is inevitable. I think that, and I thought about this for a while too. It's like, where would I say that the use case for Java is now? And I've used it on and off again. When I came to some all, they were 100% Java. Uh, I had worked for a while at WebMD, and then at a little startup, little healthcare startup afterwards, both of which were. 100% Java based. So in between doing Ruby on Rails and other things, I've definitely come back to it uh, uh, time and time again. If I were going to nail the use case, though, I'd say if you if you knew you were going to need to get a couple hundred engineers that could absolutely use a particular technology, and you knew you weren't going to have years and years, five years to build a team that had to be you know in 12 months or something like that. You know the number of technology suites that you could say that you could do that with is probably down to some kind of Windows, Microsoft technology pile, uh, or or Java and its ecosystem. Like I think those are your only two options if you had to put together a decent sized team very quickly, um, because you know you're going to have just the availability of talent that you're not going to be able to pry out in in a lot of other areas, and it'll be reasonably experienced talent, it'll be people that have been doing it for 10 mm -hmm. years, like it'll be a you know decent, competent group of folks that you could actually put together. You know, assuming you could pay them, there's a lot of ifs there, but mm -hmm. I think that's an absolute use case for it. Uh, it's not a use case that I deal with on a daily basis, but you know, I could see if you wanted to put together some kind of a company that, you know, was going to be building, you know, say uh, a, a large, you know, United States wide EHR application or you know, you were going to retool some governmental agency, it would be a completely reasonable choice at that point. What about the, um, the legacy in terms of influence on modern languages and things like that? Well, I think it proved the case that a managed environment is a reasonable sort of thing to do. Um, I think it proved the case that managing your own memory is an absolute <laughs> Terrible idea. Like, <laughs> I can't think of a single language right now that would count itself as a count. Uh, we make you manage your own memory as a feature. Probably the closest you come to is is maybe a language like Rust, which mm -hmm. you know gives you tools for at least you know you're, you're still kind of managing things, but at least it gives you tools to ensure that you do it correctly. Uh, but I don't think there's a single language out there that would aim for C's. You know, stick any old value in that pointer you want and see what the heck happens. Like. Uh, so I think it's proven that case. And I think it's, uh, you know, like I said, proven the case that a, a managed environment can certainly work one that does things for you. Um, I think it's definitely proved the case that uh, to be productive, you don't need an immensely complicated programming language. Uh, I think there's a place for complicated languages, uh, but I think people should be aware that you can solve a lot of important problems with fairly simple, straightforward languages. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of... Uh, Go was inspired in many ways by things that were successful about Java. I, I don't know who would, if people would build it this way, but I definitely think of Go as kind of a sane evolution of, of Java as well. You know, it's like Java in some ways needs to kind of stay where, where it's at, uh, but you can still take a big chunk of what you learn and that, you know, Go looks a lot like C, obviously, because of the person that created it too, but, you know, that was a lesson that I think Java demonstrated, which is that syntax absolutely matters. Um, and and so there you know there are those for sure. I'm sure there are some other ones as well. I think it taught us a lot about the role of object orientation and where that really works and where it doesn't work so well. Uh, it was interesting when Scala came out that Scala really pushed the notion that it was kind of multi paradigm. You can absolutely do object oriented stuff, but you can do functional co you know functional programming and function composition. Uh, and so I think it real you know it reflected this realization that there are other tools that maybe should be in the tool set besides just objects, which I think Java did well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's it'd be hard to say that you know uh, it didn't Im impact a lot of things. I mean, before Java, I think you used make files for everything, mm -hmm. and then they came up with Ant and then Maven, and I don't think anyone on the planet expects to build things with make files anymore. You, every language has got its own little you know buildy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's end up by, by talking about what you're up to today. Um, some all you said it was all Java when you got there. What is what is some all and uh, what are you doing? Yeah, so some all is uh, a uh, New York tech startup that is uh, focused on building uh, tools for small and medium sized businesses. That's been its uh, focus really the whole time I'm there. I've been there. Uh, 
uh, we're focused primarily or, or, or intensely on point of sale right now. So what we're looking at doing is bringing uh, a chunk of the tooling that I think you see on the e-commerce side of the world uh, over to uh, more traditional retailers that are doing, you know, have smart point of sale devices. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there that hasn't been well addressed. Um, retail, you know, despite the, despite the, I guess, dire warnings that everyone gives is still a huge chunk of our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's uh, some great opportunities there to help people that, you know, we depend on for, you know, a lot of what we do on a daily basis. Certainly what we're not buying at Amazon online. Uh, some all, uh, when I joined, some all was actually doing Java 100%. So they were using a f framework called Play, which was kind of a Rails inspired, you know, write the code, refresh it in your browser, you know, kind of a kind of an, a kind of a framework. Um, we migrated. It was big monolithic app. We migrated to microservices uh, fairly on, uh, fairly early on, uh, using a technology called uh, uh, Drop Wizard uh, and uh, some. Uh, some uh, Netflix tooling, uh, and then we got big on the container side, so we picked up Docker fairly early on, uh, which actually drove the next uh, push, which was away from Java entirely, mm -hmm. uh, to Haskell, which is what our back end is in now. Uh, well, Todd Sutston, um, thanks for coming on the show and um, giving us a little trip down memory lane about Java and just uh, the history of programming. Yeah, way. it was my pleasure. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod. And my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.